Good afternoon. I'm Tom Putnam, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum, and on behalf of Tom McNaught, executive director of the Kennedy Library Foundation, and all of my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you for coming. Let me begin by acknowledging the generous underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, including lead sponsor Bank of America, Boston Capital, the Boston Foundation, the Lowell Institute, Raytheon, and our media partners, the Boston Globe, NECM, and WBUR. I also want to thank our moderator, award-winning journalist Ray Suarez, senior correspondent for the NewsHour on PBS, and author of several books, including most recently, The Holy Vote, The Politics of Faith in America. Signed copies of President Carter's new book are on sale in our bookstore, and we will take written questions from the audience, so please submit them to our staff during the forum. This library will always have a special connection with President Jimmy Carter, as it was during his presidency in October 1979 that the library was dedicated. Let's watch an excerpt from his speech on that historic occasion. President Kennedy took office understanding that the texture of social and economic life of our nation and our people was changing, and that our nation and our people would have to change with it. Change is the law of life, he once said. And those who look only to the past or the present are certain to miss the future. He had a vision of how America could meet and master the forces of change that he saw around him. President Kennedy entered the White House convinced that racial and religious discrimination was morally indefensible. Later that conviction became a passion for him, a passion that his brother Robert shared and that his son has so well said carried forward as a Southerner, as a Georgian, I saw at first hand how the moral leadership of the Kennedy administration helped to undo the wrongs that grew out of our nation's history. Today the problem of human rights in the United States is shifting from inequality of legal rights to inequality of opportunity. But the question of legal rights is not yet settled. We are all Americans. We are all children of the same God. Racial violence and racial hatred can have no place among us in the South or in the North. Any spare moments I've had over the last couple of weeks have been spent reading President Carter's White House Diary, which is filled with insights into his character and his presidency, including more than a few surprises. We all recall the breath of fresh air the Carters brought to our nation's capital at a pivotal moment in our history, symbolized by their decision to walk down Pennsylvania Avenue as part of the inaugural parade, preceded only by Thomas Jefferson in doing so. Who knew the suggestion came from Senator William Proxmire? Not for the symbolism that so perfectly captured the country's imagination and which President Carter anticipated, but because Senator Proxmire hoped that by walking, the president would send a message to the nation about the importance of physical fitness. <laughs> Later that night, President and Mrs. Carter enjoyed their first meal in the White House with a diary notation explaining that before moving to Washington, Mrs. Carter spoke with a White House chef to ask if they could prepare the kind of meals their family had enjoyed in the South. The cook replied, yes, ma'am, we've been fixing that kind of food for the servants for a long time. <laughs> well, not exactly what the kitchen staff meant. Through his life work, both in and out of the White House, Jimmy Carter has proven himself to be one of our country's most dedicated and tireless public servants, who during his years in our nation's highest office, in the words of Vice President Walter Mondale, obeyed the law, told the truth, and kept the peace. Lyndon Johnson famously described his presidential library as telling the story of our time with a bark off, showing all the facts, not just the joys and triumphs, but the sorrow and failures too. 
And the same can be said about President Carter's White House diary, which recounts as many legislative and diplomatic successes, including the Panama Canal Treaty and the Camp David Accords, as well as his bumpy relationship with the press, travails of the 1980 campaign, and the long ordeal of the Iranian hostage crisis. In fact, it is part of the same October 20, 1979 diary entry in which he discusses his appearance at the dedication of this library that President Carter describes the decision to allow the Shah of Iran to receive medical treatment in the United States, one of the many factors that will later precipitate the hostage crisis. Through it all, one is struck by President Carter's honesty with himself and with others, his love of his family and country, his sense of decency and firmly held beliefs. I was reminded of a story told by Mrs. Carter, who spoke from this stage earlier this year. She described feeling calm on the morning of her husband's inaugural, knowing that the man who was about to take the presidential oath that afternoon was the very same person who, the day before, had helped her mop up water in the garage of their home in Georgia after a water pipe burst from the cold. Though we faced extraordinary responsibilities and lived a life we could have never ever dreamed of, she states, we are first and always Rosalind and Jimmy Carter from Plains, Georgia. In reading his diary, I was also struck by this remarkable combination. A man who one day could be on his hands and knees to clear his garage floor of water would the next be standing tall before the world, delivering a clarion call on behalf of energy independence, nuclear nonproliferation, and human rights. Why should we be surprised then by his remarkable post-presidency, the most successful in our nation's history, as he one day constructs Habitat for Humanity homes with his Georgian neighbors while interacting with world leaders the next, earning the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts through the Carter Center to wage peace, fight disease, and build democracy throughout the globe. Rosalind and I have deep roots in Plains, he writes in the final sentences of this new book, but we never forget our profound connection to the millions of others with whom we share this earth. In our hearts, we have made a promise to do all we can to help those who have been less fortunate. And in this way, like so many other private citizens, we are striving to do our part to help the United States fulfill its destiny as a democracy worthy of its founders. Mr. President, you honor us here today with your presence, and on behalf of so many of our fellow citizens, we thank you and Mrs. Carter for your service to our country and for your tireless humanitarian efforts, which evoke the best of the American spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ray Suarez and the 39th President of the United States, Jimmy Carter. Well, sir, it's good to see you again. Well, it's nice to be with you too, Ray. Thank you. Uh, let's talk about this remarkable and heavy <laughs> um, when you were writing it, yes. jotting down notes at the end of a long day, dictating portions of it into a tape recorder, at that moment, were you thinking, someday, somebody will read this? <laughs> no, I didn't. I thought it was just a private diary that I would uh, retain for my family, perhaps, and share it with Rosalind. But uh, seven or eight times a day, I had a small tape recorder, and when... Somebody left my office or when I made a decision that I knew would not be reported to the new public uh, press. Every week they give everything that a president says in public. But, so I didn't include those things. But if I didn't like somebody, if I did like somebody, if I made a difficult decision, or if it was a doubtful about the future, I just dictated my own personal thoughts into that tape recorder. And when I filled up a tape, I would throw it in the outbasket and put a new one in. And my secretary, Susan Clown, when she had time, would type those up. I never read one of them until I got home, and then I found out I had 5,000 pages of diary notes. <laughs> so you talk about this being heavy. <laughs> you ought to see the original. It's this long, and it's available, by the way, in the library later on. And so this is a summary, but not a ch changed sentence. I didn't change anything in it, if, even if I didn't approve of what I wrote 30 years ago. I didn't change it. So it's a very frank picture of what a president feels in the Oval Office making a difficult and sometimes delightful decisions that relate to America. Some of the frank, as you say, <laughs> uh, revelations, remembrances of a day uh, probably would have been seen as um, sour grapes or a little rough 
or not really very presidential, if you had published this in 1984 or 1985 or 1986, does time take a little of the sting out of some of these reminiscences? I think so. I think it does for the reader, uh, who might have forgotten a lot and need to be reminded of some interesting events, whether they like it or not. But it also makes it possible for me to comment on people, many of whom are not still living with me. And uh, obviously, folks can read this uh, diary and my comments up to date on what I said back in those days and kind of get a perspective on history that you wouldn't get otherwise. And I don't think anybody else has ever done this. Of course, President Johnson and Lyndon, uh, Lyndon Johnson and, and Nixon had uh, tape recordings, some secret, some not so secret. <laughs> but uh, but they, um, they were recording what they said to other people. This is my own inner thoughts. So I think it gives a good most um, kind of a bird's eye view of what the presidency is and what it means to an individual person who serves there than anything that's ever been written. The remarkable thing about this time is that in some ways World War II is very much with us yes. in the 70s. We're living in the long shadow of World War II. There's still an East and West Germany. Sure. There's still a very, very hot Cold War. Uh, the embers are barely cool on Watergate at this time. It is a terrible time. I, I mean, I, as I read this again, <laughs> I thought, what a terrible time to be president. Did you realize this when you were writing this? <laughs> well, I didn't realize it when I was running much, but I, I realized it when I got there, obviously. Um, and you're right, the World War was still with me, like it was with John Kennedy, who came almost a generation ahead of me. I was a Navy man like he was. I served in the Navy 12 years. In fact, I served longer in the Navy than anyone except Dwight Eisenhower since the Civil War in the military. So I had a military background, and I could see a lot from that perspective. But uh, it's hard for people in the modern day now, particularly young folks, to realize that we were still involved deeply in a Cold War. And every decision that I made, no matter where it was, every decision that the Congress made, every news story from a, from a newspaper or television program was shaped substantially by our competition with the Soviet Union, who was then the, the dual superpower on Earth. Now we're the only one. But then it was an equal competition. Uh, they had the same nuclear capability that we did. They had the same economic influence that we did. And in every country in Africa or Latin America or Asia, we were constantly uh, competing with the Soviet Union for access there. Uh, who would be our trade partner? Who would vote with us in the United Nations? So it was a competition everywhere. And so almost every decision I made was shaped by that uh, competition with the Soviet Union. And, and the constant threat at that time over my head, like it was John Kennedy, was let's avoid a nuclear exchange, because I knew that uh, I might get a, a, a notice someday that the Soviet Union has launched intercontinental missiles toward the United States. From the time of launch in Siberia until they landed in Washington, New York, was 26 minutes. And I would have had to decide during that 26 minutes how and when uh, to respond. So that was a constant threat for me that doesn't exist anymore, thank goodness. the personalities in this book, the countries of great interest to the United States during this period, could fill up tomorrow morning's <laughs> newspaper. Sure. When the Soviets invade Afghanistan sure. during your term, yeah. the unwinding of that story is going on exactly. right at this moment. Exactly. And the Middle East is uh, still pertinent. And, and as you said, that, that whole uh, region of the world, our competition with China is still there. I was the first one after 35 years to normalize diplomatic relations with China. And at that time, China was a backward country that had zero economic growth and freedom, no free enterprise system, uh, not really a comp competitor of ours, uh, and those kind of things were, were in the news uh, today. So um, I think a, a lot of the issues that we face then are still there. What to do about Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, that's, and, and then also about the emerging countries in, in Africa.
uh, when I was president, one of the major threats was from the perpetuation of apartheid. And that's where I put my human rights program into the most vivid confrontation with those who insisted on racial discrimination uh, or white supremacy in both Rhodesia then and then also in South Africa. So those kind of things are still going on in the world. You saved Chrysler. Yeah, that's um, right. It needed saving again as yeah. it happened. I mean, the, the <laughs> emanations from this time yeah. played out over the next several decades, and you were out of office to see most of it. Could you even pick up a newspaper in the 1990s and say, oh, this again, uh, here we go again? It must have been um, to have that vantage point and shake your head some days. We're still dealing with this. Exactly. And, of course, the energy crisis then was my preeminent uh, domestic issue. And when I came into office, we were importing 8.6 million barrels of oil per day. And I set about to cut that in half, and I did. In five years, it was down to 4.3 million barrels per day. And uh, now it's back up to about 10 million barrels per day that we import from foreign countries. So the energy crisis is still right in front of us as a major issue. I not only bailed out Chrysler, but I bailed out one other thing, and that was New York City. <laughs> and because uh, the headlines there was, was uh, Gerald Ford to New York City dropped dead, I carried New York, and that's probably what put me in the White House, was, Billy, was, was uh, saving New York City. But I, anyway, I like that uh, ref retrospective look in some areas, but sometimes it's still a little bit painful. I think the most painful for me was to know that I negotiated assiduously between uh, Israel and Egypt to give full rights to the Palestinians and a peace between Israel and Egypt because they had five, four wars in 25 years. And uh, when I left office, I thought everything was on track for a permanent peace in the Middle East. And then it was basically abandoned by my successors. And uh, now we're back uh, looking at... Uh, as another threat. Well, let's talk about the Camp David Accords. The uh, Six-Day War was barely a decade in the world's rearview mirror when the Camp right. David Accords were uh, negotiated. What was said in those negotiations about the future of Gaza and the West Bank? Well, Sadat, when he came to to Camp David, and we spent 13 days there with him and Begin. The only thing Sadat wanted was that Israel had to leave Egyptian territory, which was the Sinai Desert. And the other thing was that the Palestinians had to be given their full rights. And those were the only two guidelines I had from Sadat. And he was the most uh, forthcoming member of the Egyptian delegation there. On the other hand, Menachem Begin was at least forthcoming is ready in their 50-person delegation. All of his cabinet members were ahead of him, saying, let's go ahead and do it. And it was the last day at Camp David that we finally got an agreement between Begin and Sadat. But the uh, Israelis agreed at that time uh, to withdraw their military and political forces from in the entire West Bank, to stop building uh, settlements, and to let the Palestinians have what Begin called full autonomy, to run their own affairs, basically. Well... That's what existed when I left office, but that hasn't happened, as you know. But the peace treaty between Israel and Egypt that came six months after that, in April of 79, uh, not a word has ever been violated in 30-something years. So Israel and Egypt are still at peace. And although Egypt now has a new government, I don't believe that any violation will be contemplated by, by the new Egyptian leaders to throw away any of that peace agreement, peace treaty, that has kept them at peace now for 30-something years. But during that intervening 30-plus years, it's sometimes been a pretty chilly peace. <laughs> um, is there a danger uh, to that bilateral relation from the overthrow and departure of Hosni Mubarak? No, uh, Mubarak was a personal ally of uh, Israel in, for instance, keeping the Gaza one and a half million people in a complete prison. He wouldn't let them go out into the Sinai Desert and, and have communication with the outside world. And of course, they can't uh, go in northward into the West Bank and Israel either. Uh, 
But I think that's one thing that will be changed under the new Egyptian leadership. They've already committed themselves to opening up Gaza and let the Gaza people have some degree of freedom. That will change. But the treaty between Israel and Egypt not to go to war, although it's a cold, it's a cold peace, yes, but that, that uh, warm peace only lasted two or three years with the assassination of uh, Sadat and then with the death of, uh, of, of Menachem Begin and others, uh, there's been very little uh, travel of Egyptians into, say, Jerusalem. An ambassador's there, the embassy's there, and there's still a good many Israelis who go to Egypt for, on, as tourists, but not from Egypt into Israel. And it's primarily because the Egyptian people disagree strongly with what Israelis have been doing to the Palestinians and what Mubarak has supported that, that they interpret to be persecution of the Palestinians. So Mubarak has been kind of a, an anachronism or an anomaly is a better word uh, compared to the other Egyptian people. And I think the new leaders of I Egypt will now mirror very accurately that the Egyptians want to be friendly with the Palestinian people. The West Bank has been in constant motion since the 1970s. Yes. Um, and at various points, things have happened where people have said, ah, this helps clear the way, whether it's Jordan giving up its claims to what a, a, was Jordanian territory before the 1967 war, uh, whether it's uh, the PLO saying, yes, yes, we recognize that Israel is an established fact and we know that the country is not going anywhere. And yet there are hundreds of thousands of Israeli citizens living in the West Bank, harder and harder and more and more extensive infrastructure built out from Israel across the old 67 border is unraveling that world that's grown up there since 1967, getting harder and harder by the day, from your view. I would say it was getting harder and harder every day until the so-called Arab Spring began. But in my opinion, that is the first step toward unraveling the trend that you just described as getting harder and harder. I think there's much more likelihood now than there was, say, six or eight months ago that we'll see a peace agreement in the Middle East with Israel withdrawing basically from the West Bank. There are now about 500,000 uh, Israelis in Palestine, if you include the pre-67 line. And... Uh, the basic proposal endorsed by all 23 Arab countries is let's have peace, let Israel withdraw to the 67 borders, but let those borders be modified by exchange of territory, which would leave about half of the Israeli settlers in what was previously Palestine, near Jerusalem, and then swap an equivalent amount of land to the Palestinians. So that is, a, that is a, the formula that is also approved officially by the United States government and by the International Quartet, which is the U.S. government and the United Nations and the European Union and Russia. They all approve that as well. So the Arab countries and the United States and the international community basically approves that formula. But now the next step comes, how do you induce Israelis to withdraw from their confiscation of, their occupation of, their settling of, the, uh, the West Bank in its almost in its entirety. And I think that will have to come if Israel is going to have peace, which has been my prayer for the last 30 years, for Israel to have peace, which means that you have to have peace for their neighbors as well. As the so-called Arab Spring has continued, yeah. we've seen that there's more than one way that this could go. Tunisia was over fairly quickly. Yes. The leader leaving the country to a well-funded exile. <laughs> but then in... Yemen, there's been resistance from the clique at the top. In Libya, there's been out-and-out -out civil war. In Syria, there's been brutal repression of uh, public demonstrations and a secret police that's so dug into the population that you're not even sure you can express your opinion to your neighbor. Uh, could this be snuffed out in the next several months? No. Uh, you certainly can't snuff out what's already happened in Tunisia or, or Egypt. Or Egypt. Sure. Uh, the Carter Center will probably be monitoring both of those elections. That we, we, that's one of our practices is to monitor troubled elections, and we've been invited into both of those. Uh, that will be a, our 84th and 85th election, by the way, that we've monitored. 
So I think that that's pretty well underway. We don't know what's going to happen in the other countries yet. Uh, it's still doubtful about whether Bashar Assad will be successful in stamping out or controlling the uprising in Syria. Uh, I think Yemen is uh, more, more likely to see their leader go. Uh, Bahrain has been stabilized by the influx of Saudi Arabian troops and, and support. I, I think Bahrain is likely to be stable. Saudi Arabia has not been threatened yet. So I think that the major countries still, or as I've just described them, Libya is going to be a, a dicey thing. I think Libya might wind up maybe divided unless NATO troops are, are fully, uh, and Air Force are fully successful. So what, what has happened in the ancillary parts of the Mideast is very important. I've already described what I think will happen to the Palestinian issue in the future. They now will have much more support uh, from Egypt than they have had in the past, and that's a result of the so-called uh, Arab Spring. And Lebanon is still a divided country. I don't know. We monitored the election in Lebanon April before last. It was, a, it was an honest and fair election. It was quite safe, but Hezbollah is still playing a major role as part of the government in Lebanon. Uh, I, th I think one of the good things that happened in the last few days in which the Carter Center was deeply involved has been the reconciliation between Hamas and Fatah. And I never have seen a way for Israel to negotiate a peace agreement with half the Palestinians. And now getting them together will mean that they'll have a better chance to have successful negotiations. And Hamas is willing to step back and let PLO, in which they don't have a membership, and they do all the negotiations with Israel under Mahmoud Abbas. And Mahmoud Abbas, if he reaches any kind of peace agreement with Israel, Hamas has pledged to me and publicly that they will accept the agreement provided the, the Palestinians approve it in a referendum. So I think there are some chances now to see peace in the Middle East that I thought was pretty well dormant and very discouraging for last year. Hasn't the Hamas PLO Concordat uh, created a difficult situation for the United States, which has declared Hamas a terrorist organization. Well, yes. Of course, there are a lot of ways to look at this. As you, as you probably know, uh, Nelson Mandela was a terrorist in our country until last June because he was part of the ANC in the past. As a matter of fact, we monitored the election, all three elections in Palestine. The One of the most interesting ones was in January 2006, when the United States and Israel supported Hamas having candidates running for office, as you may remember. And all the Hamas candidates pledged a nonviolent attitude if they got into the government in the future. To the surp surprise of most people, Hamas won the election. And after they won the election, then Israel and the United States declared that they were terrorists and couldn't take office. And not only were they forbidden from taking office, but all the Hamas candidates who were engineers and college professors and farmers and so forth, uh, who were elected and lived in the West Bank, were put in prison by Israel for three years or more. And now most of them are released. Some of them are still in prison. But so Hamas was basically a, a terrorist, declared a terrorist because of some bad things they've done. There's no doubt about that. But also because they won the election. So I think now that Hamas, in order to be accepted, will have to basically agree First of all, to, to acknowledge Israel's right to exist, certainly within the 67 borders. Secondly, to pledge ceasefire. And they call it a hudna, which might slat, they have said it can last 40 years. No, no violence in Gaza and in the West Bank. And third, to accept as many of the previous uh, agreements as Israel will do, will do. So those three things are, are, are basically what I believe can happen under the best circumstances and might very well happen in the future. You've been pretty outspoken about the trajectory of that part of the world and how it looks to you and, and what the possibilities for peace are. Have you been surprised from time to time about the hurt feelings, the backlash, the criticism that's been directed at you for what you've had to say about the Middle East? Yes, to some degree. I've written two books about it recently. One was Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid, and the other one was, we can have peace in the Holy Land. And both of those describe my views about it, which I think are acceptable 
to most Americans, and I think to most Americans who happen to be Jewish Americans, and, um, and the world. I think it's a balanced uh, approach. But uh, as you know, it's not a very popular thing in our country to say anything that criticizes the policies of the incumbent government of Israel. The Carter Center monitors this very closely. Uh, we have full-time office in Jerusalem. We have a full-time office in Ramallah in the West Bank. We have a full-time office in Gaza as well. So we have ability, which very few Western organizations have, constantly to understand what's going on within those three entities of the future West Bank. And, of course, part of the Hamas delegation are in Syria, so we have been going to Syria in the past as well. So that, that's one of the things that we do. Uh, recently, I've been in the Mideast. Our people have been there now. They just got back the day before yesterday for three weeks helping with the Palestinian uh, unity agreement. Uh, Rosa and I just got back from Cuba. I just got back from North Korea. So when, when there's a, some problems in the world, sometimes we feel free to go there and try to work out peace and understanding. In this book, uh, it, it seems like you hardly sit still for, a, for more than a few minutes at a time. <laughs> um, when the man in his 80s looks at this book and confronts the man in his 50s, it, it did, you, did you wear well? It makes me tired, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I think so. And one of the things that, uh, that I emphasize there, I think, accurately, is that I, I haven't changed. You know, I, I think I'm still basically the same person with the same commitments that I made in my inaugural speech and when I got the Democratic nomination in 1980 and so forth. Uh, I don't think I've changed as a person. We still promote peace and human rights around the world, and, and sometimes we do some things that are not very popular. Um, but I, I've made a policy in the last 30 years since I left the White House. I don't ever go to a foreign place that's without notifying in advance the White House and the State Department. And if the president ever decides he'd rather might not go there, if he says don't go, I don't go. And that's happened a number of times for different reasons. And I always do a trip report meticulously on the way home, and the day after I get back home, I send a, a trip report in its entirety to the White House, the State Department, and sometimes to the Security, uh, to the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, just explain what the Carter Center is doing. And so we try not to ever, you know, get crossed up with the U.S. government. But, but see, the U.S. government, won't, they won't talk to Hamas. They won't talk to Cubans. They won't talk to the North Koreans. They won't talk to the to the number one party in Nepal, for instance. And the Carter Center talks to them, and then we relay what they say to the White House and State Department, and, and sometimes the White House and State Department are very glad to get the report. I can't say 100%. <laughs> well, you say you're still the same man, well, I and I, I, I'm real willing to take that at face value. <laughs> are there, were there passages that when you look back at it, you thought, oh, I know better than that today? better in 2010 when this was being edited <laughs> than I understood this in 1978 when I wrote it. Well, there are a good many like that. Um, when people ask me what would I change most, uh, if I had one change to make when I was in the White House, I always say I would send one more helicopter to rescue the hostages. And Apparently that, somebody heard you say that. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So that happened, as you know, just a week or two ago when the first helicopter crashed and then they had a standby to go in. Well, we knew we had to have six helicopters and we expanded that to eight, but three helicopters failed and we had left with five and we couldn't rescue all of our hostages and bring back the people who were trying to rescue them. So we had to cancel. That was a, a very sad occasion for me, of course, and, and not getting the hostages out. And uh, so that's one of the things that I would certainly have changed if I had it. If I knew now what I know then, I would have sent one more helicopter. Nobody knows what would have happened. Uh, I think I would have started the Carter Center four years later, but that's nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I think the thing that I've learned most in the last 30 years is to understand the poverty-stricken and suffering and forgotten and neglected poor people on earth.
I had a hazy view of that when I was in the White House. We tried to have foreign aid as much as we could, using the argument that we were competing with the Soviet Union, you know, in Burkina Faso and in Mali and so forth. If we don't go there and help them, then the Soviet Union is going to go there and, and be their friends instead of us. So we had a very strong foreign aid program. But now, Rosa and I have programs in 73 countries in the world. 35 of them are in Africa, and we go to Africa often. And uh, we've gotten to know those people and help them primarily with uh, tropical diseases, what the World Health Organization calls neglected tropical diseases. They're not even known anymore in this country. Uh, Dracunculiasis, schistosomiasis, trachoma, lymphatic filariasis, uh, onchocerciasis, those are diseases. But they afflict hundreds of millions of, uh, of Africans. And so we work with pharmaceutical companies who give us free medicine, and we deal with the diseases in that way. But in the process, we've gotten to know those people very well. And I have learned, well, that they're just as intelligent as I am and just as hardworking as I am and just as ambitious and their family values are just as good as mine. They, they just need a chance in life. And, and this is what I've learned much more vividly and much more personally than when I was fortunate enough to be president. So sometimes you're making policy in a kind of abstract way. Sure. Even when you're a well-informed, well-briefed leader. Absolutely. I, I think one of the things that, that benefited me when I was in the White House was I had, I had a wife who had campaigned independently all the time I campaigned. I had three sons who had campaigned independently of me and Rosen all the time I was campaigning. And I had a mother who also campaigned independently. We had seven campaigns running on every day. Mm to the surprise of our opponents when we came in first. And, uh, and so they still shared with me uh, every day what they learned about the nation as they continued to travel around. So I had a, some insight from my own family members into what Americans were thinking and what their ambitions were that I wouldn't have gotten from State Department briefings and that sort of thing. But uh, yes, no matter who, who is in the White House, th there's a vast area of... Uh, of things that need to be comprehended more deeply that are absent from a president's busy mind. And that would be particularly true, say, in the depths of, of villages in the African jungles or African desert. Those kinds of things. You just don't know. I'm glad you mentioned, Rosalind, because I think by the lights of 2011, many of the things that she was doing as a matter of course, day to day, week to week, yeah. don't seem all that remarkable. But by the lights of 1977 and 1978, they were. You depended on her a great deal for intelligence from the field, didn't you? Yeah, not only from the United States, from the 50 states, but she had campaigned, as I said, independently of me all during the 76 campaign and 80 as well. But uh, I would send Rosen to foreign countries when I couldn't go myself. And they soon learned that she could speak more accurately for me than the Secretary of State could or the National Security Advisor. Uh, and she was a very strong-willed person. For instance, I sent her once on a, on a seven-nation tour in, in Latin America. And, and she was able to confront the dictator in Brazil and demand that he stop purifying uranium to make nuclear weapons. And she was able to go into Colombia and tell the president that his Secretary of Defense, his Minister of Defense, was taking bribes from the, from the uh, drug dealers. You know, were people ready for that? I don't know whether well, they were ready or not. No, no, I mean, both, both in the protocol office at the State Department and in those foreign capitals. I were people say, ready for the wife of a leader to carry your proxy in that full way? I don't know if they're ready or not. But they, they, I was a president. And, uh, and I thought it was important. And, of course, the State Department was fully aware of what was going on because they, plus the National Security Advisor staff, briefed Rosen before she went. And, and on the trip that I just described to you, uh, my Secretary of State's wife actually accompanied Rosalind on the trip. Cy Vance's wife did. So it was not a secret. But I think some of the um, foreign leaders were astonished when Rosen would refuse to spend her full time going to orphanages and hospitals and things of that kind and say, I want to talk to you about 
about your nuclear program. I want to talk to you about the drug production in your country. I want to talk to you about your, your violations of human rights. She, she was very uh, willing to do it, to put it mildly. <laughs> and she used to get multiple briefings, which she wanted and which I wanted her to have. And finally, one day I said, Rosa, why don't you just come on and sit in on the cabinet meetings in, in the background, and then I don't have to spend half the week telling you what happened <laughs> in the cabinet meeting. So she sat in the background, and as you may remember from those days, she got a lot of criticism. Well, that's from what I was. Media. I'm glad you brought it up instead <laughs> yeah. of me bringing it up. But but it was true that there were a lot of people in the United States who saw that and thought, wait a minute, we elected him, yeah, I know, but not her. But you know, since then, I'm not saying that Rosen broke the ice, but she. Because Eleanor Roosevelt, long before, was a very prominent figure, mostly after, mostly after Roosevelt did. But, but I think that other presidents' wives, including the current one, now plays a much more dynamic role in international and domestic affairs than ever would before. So I was very proud of her. Because we were still in the era of debate over the ERA. Yeah. Uh, we were just a few administrations removed from far more ceremonial far more symbolic activities on the part of the First Lady. Yes. Uh, yes, there was Eleanor Roosevelt, but there was also Pat Nixon just a few years before with much more uh, likely to land in Ghana and um, go to the state dinner in native dress and, yeah. and that kind yeah. of thing than to and drill the leadership. And Truman and others. It didn't want to have anything to do with public life. That's true. Well, as I pointed out, one of my, one of my proudest moments in the presidency was when Rosa was chosen as having uh, among the ten most beautiful legs on earth. <laughs> so that, that well, was, that did was she some... represent <laughs> one of the ten women, or were her two legs twenty percent of the most <laughs> two of the ten most beautiful legs? Or that's right. Oh, okay. That's right. Two of the twenty most beautiful. Two legs. of the twenty most beautiful. <laughs> legs. But you say that was a lot of uh, laughter and closeness to and with me and Rosa. Well, that's good. It was, I'm glad it was, that she it was, was recognized all for all her talents. Oh, she did. That's true. She was. <laughs> and she still concentrates on mental health, which she did then, including when I was governor eight years before I was elected president. We got to see your legs more than most other presidents <laughs> do. Uh, and there was comment at the time as well, because Eisenhower, for better or worse, wasn't photographed jogging. Uh, and the Secret Service agents who follow him around could probably smoke more because they knew they wouldn't have to <laughs> run after the boss. Uh, but you, um, and, and it, I had a laugh at one point where you were freezing out on the, um, the C&O Canal Trail because yeah, you see your, sir, <laughs> your Secret Service detail couldn't pick you up because they were caught in traffic. And then you admit that it's kind of your fault because you didn't want anybody to know where you were. That's right. Yeah, we never told anybody ahead of time. And, and we, ne we never discovered while we were jogging, except once when I happened to, to intercept a, C a CBS cameraman on the way out the CNO Canal. He went immediately, and by the time I came back, we saw all the cameras up on the bridge waiting for me to come underneath. So we, we wanted to keep it secret. I was running, I was a fanatic runner back in those days. I was running about 40 miles a week, which is a lot of running. But I was keeping in pretty good shape. Well, that's why we're able to be here today, I think. <laughs> because many of the leaders you mention in this book aren't able to run anywhere. <laughs> no, stop. But, you know, as a reminder of what a pivotal time the 70s were for the world, for the country, um, a, a lot of legacy, unhandled questions from previous decades, and also pitching forward to the problems that would still plague us uh, all these many years later. That's true. Are you, when you see, for instance, um, the Reagan staff dismantling the solar uh, collectors on the top of the White House, sure. when one of the first things the, president, the new president did was end the Basic Educational Opportunity Grant, which allowed a lot of poor kids to, uh, to go to colleges they never would have been able to attend, did that make real in a way that simply the numbers and the, the electoral college didn't, what it meant to lose? How things could be undone 
in just a very short time. I think, I think so. I, I don't want to be too personal about it, but it, obviously when you work on the Middle East peace and you think you've got a comprehensive agreement there and then you leave office and there's, not, there's hardly a word said about Middle East peace for the next eight years or when you work for four years and get an energy policy that is reducing dramatically energy consumption in this country and building up alternative sources of energy and, and conservation particularly, and see it totally, not only abandoned, but uh, derided within a few days after President Reagan comes in office, those things do, do um, hurt. And, and uh, the most controversial thing that I ever did, the most difficult political challenge I ever had in my life was the Panama Canal Treaties. And uh, signing those uh, with President Reagan, then Governor Reagan, constantly sniping at me for giving away our canal, uh, and then having to get 67 votes in the Senate was the most difficult challenge I've ever had, much more difficult than running for office or being elected. But, uh, but I think in the long run, some of those things have panned out okay. For instance, the Panamanians, who were derided then as drug addicts who couldn't manage you know, their own affairs, now have five times as much revenue from the Panama Canal Treaty as we did when we turned it over to them. And now they're building a second channel there, which we had doubled the... Uh, traffic going through. So some of the things we did have turned out uh, quite well. And I think our human rights policy is another one. When I, you have to remember how, how controversial some of those things were, because before I became uh, president, the United States presidents were habitually in bed with the dictators, particularly in, say, Latin America, all over the world. That's, that's been shown up lately in the so-called Arab Spring, how we've been in bed with all of those dictators that have now been overthrown. But before I came in office, this was a case in almost every country in Latin America. Uh, without, almost without exception, South America was dictatorships. And, and we would trade with the dictators to make sure we got first crack at bauxite and tin and steel and copper and, and pineapples and bananas. And so the American corporation would, would harvest great benefits from our being cozy with the dictators. So if anybody challenged them, if, say, native Indian Americans down in those countries wanted to have freedom of uh, speech or human rights, or if the poor people wanted to rise up and have better things, uh, then we, consider, we just automatically abandoned them as, ter as uh, communists. And so we stamped out the communists, and we would send in U.S. Marines or Army troops, sometimes to spend several years, to protect the dictators. So we changed all that. And it was very unpopular. It's hard now to remember how unpopular some of those things were. And yet, um, there's a certain stylish admiration of hard-headed, unsentimental leadership that would just say, look, we need the tin. We need the bauxite to make the aluminum. I don't care who's running the show in Santiago, sure. in Bogota. Um, in, sure. in Sao Paulo. I heard that from every, everywhere. You know, the, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the Business Roundtable, all of them would come forward and say, look, you're destroying, uh, damaging the American economic system. But it turned out to be good because, because shortly after I left office, every country in South America had become a, uh, had become a uh, democracy. We have time for a couple of questions. Oh, me? Okay. Very good. Yeah. And... And they're good ones. Okay, I'm sure. How can the immobilizing partisan politics of today's Washington be overcome? Uh-oh. I thought I'd start with an easy yeah, one. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, to be simple about it, to try to get out of, of politics the unwarranted infusion of money. When I... So that's a simple answer, but it's hard to do. But when I ran for office, all we had was uh, the $2 per person checkoff that, that President Ford and I divided. And then we had the same thing four years later when President Ray, uh, then Governor Reagan and I divided. And we didn't get any other contributions for our general election. It all came from the taxpayers. And, and we didn't have enough money to spend it on negative advertising. Now there's a tremendous influx of money that pours in in the hundreds of millions of dollars per presidential 
candidate. And the Supreme Court made the most stupid decision they've ever made uh, 18 months ago <laughs> by ruling that corporations were people. So now American corporations, some of them owned partially at least by foreigners, can give an unlimited amount of money to candidates, and you don't ever know where the money came from. So this is going to even greatly uh, exacerbate an already bad situation. Now, as you know, in almost every campaign for governor, for Congress, for president, a, a large part of the advertising budget, which is almost unlimited, is spent to tear down the reputation of your opponent, to destroy his character in the public mind. And, it, and they both of them do it. And the American people say, we don't like negative advertising, but it works. So by the time the election is over, the general public feels for both of those guys really weren't qualified to hold office. And when the winner gets to Washington, he's so highly polarized in animosity for the other party that don't even talk to each other anymore. I got, I got just as much support from Republicans as I did Democrats the last two years of my, in, my, in office because a lot of my things required a very conservative support and that sort of thing. I won't go into detail about that here. But, uh, no, but you, you had a better relationship with um, Howard Baker in the Senate and Bob Michael yeah. in the House than presidents normally have to the opposite party leadership in well, the legislature. I well, I'll, I'll go ahead and mention, even in the Kennedy Library, you know, when I was in office two years, Ted Kennedy decided to run against me. And he was very popular here. And obviously, he was popular with the very liberal Democrats. So the last two years, I had to go to the, a more moderate or conservative Democrats and to the Republicans to get support for my programs. And that, and that was one of the problems. But, but the point is that there was a harmony then between Democrats and Republicans in Washington that, 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 uh, that doesn't exist anymore. And I don't think it, there's any easy way to do away with it unless the Congress ultimately sees that this is so bad that they will make public financing of the campaigns a part of the American political system. That's done in almost every other country in the world. So it's not an impossibility. It's an easy thing to do. The Carter Center monitors, as I said, we've already monitored 83 elections. We wouldn't monitor an election if it was based on the same principle that America has, that the richest candidates are the only ones that can, that can find an ability to be candidates. So we don't do that anymore. So I think that's very important. To remember. What do you feel was the most positive thing you did as president? Well, I think generically speaking, it was probably to promote human rights. Even when, as we mentioned earlier, it was not a popular thing to do. Uh, we did that inside Russia, a Soviet Union. We did it all over Latin America. and We did it throughout the world. And, um, and we stuck with it, although it was, it was sometimes not popular. And the other thing was to concentrate on peace. We maintained peace for our country, uh, despite some very difficult times, as you already pointed out. We never dropped a bomb. We never launched a missile. We never fired a bullet while I was in office uh, in, in the war. And, and, still, and still, I had a military background. I was prepared to do it if I had to. And we reached out to people that had been our adversaries, like in China. You know, President Nixon went to China in 1972, uh, had the Shanghai De Declaration. There, there's only one China, but he wouldn't say which one. So, and neither would his successors. But I find it normalized relations with China. We had peace with China and peace with, with in the Middle East and peace with, us, with others. So I think to human rights and peace. What insight did you find upon compiling the book version of your entries? Well, I think the complexity of, of things and how they are interrelated. You know, you can't deal with uh, Helmut Schmidt in, in Germany without directly or indirectly touching your relationship with France and with Great Britain and particularly with, then with the Soviet Union. For instance, Helmut Schmidt, who was, in a way, my friend. We were kind of competitors. But, uh, you won't think that he was his friend when you read the book. <laughs> but, but, uh, but I digress. Well, see, Go ahead. See what I'm talking about. <laughs> But those kind of complexities that show how people, things are intertwined uh, really make uh, uh, a surprising to read over when you get through and see. I didn't quite know how those tied together, but now after 25 or 30 years of history, I can see how they were related. As you've thought about it, to the degree that you've thought about it, 
were there style things that you might have done differently as president <laughs> that would have showed yourself to the people in a slightly different way? Um, it, it made the papers when you carried your own luggage. It made the papers, and obviously the image was beamed around the world when you walked the inaugural uh, route. There seemed to be, after the imperial presidency of Richard Nixon, an idea that you could be first citizen of the United States rather than a quasi-monarch. You know, I found out quickly that the, the American people want kind of a monarch. And I, two of the most unpopular things I ever did was doing away with hail to the chief every time I walked in the room. Uh, with state banquets, I, I didn't try to do away with it. But when I did away with hail to the chief, there was almost unanimous condemnation of me that I was derogating the importance of the White House. And the other one was when I sold the Sequoia, which was a presidential yacht. The people thought I was not being reverent enough to the offices I was holding, that I was too much of a peanut farmer, not enough of an aristocrat, you know, or something like that. So I think that shows that uh, the, the American people want something of uh, uh, an element of image of monarchy uh, in the White House. Well, maybe because we have a head of state who's also the head of government. Yeah, sure. or a head of government who's also the head of state. Sure. The president embodies the state in a way that um, where those jobs are divided, that doesn't happen. That's certainly true. Maybe I you shouldn't be that. a regular guy. Well, that, well, you asked me what I made a mistake. That was a mistake I made. I think <laughs> I would have been more, not criticized so much, if I had just maintained the, um, the trappings, of the president and let the people know I really enjoy occupying this exalted place that you revere so much. I mean, getting rid of the trumpets was probably a good idea. That, that, was, that was always a little off-putting, the trumpets. But, but you know, the, that, as I was reading this again and, and thinking about that, I, that may be what bothers people or takes some adjustment from people about having Barack and Michelle Obama living in the White House. Because the president embodies the state, we have to think about that embodiment in a slightly different way now. Yeah, we do. You know, I found that out when I started campaigning because it, I really didn't realize when I decided to run for president what a stigma uh, my part of the country had. And... Um, because of the race issue. I think I was the first one since, 19, since 1840s that was elected president from the Deep South. Lyndon Johnson was from the West, and he, and he didn't even campaign in the Deep South when he was running for election, as you know, in 64. But uh, I came to Boston, I remember, and I went to one of the historic sites out here. Later I wrote about it in, in, in a novel uh, called The Hornet's Nest, still on sale. Well, and, and I, had, I had a TV camera, and it came out where I was. I called a press conference, only one TV camera came. And they said, uh, how do you think you go, uh, a Georgian is going to get any votes in Massachusetts? And I said, well, when John Kennedy ran for president, he got a higher percentage of votes in Georgia than he did in Massachusetts. And I'm expecting the Massachusetts folks to pay me back. And they did, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> <And> they did. <laughs> but you know, in the way the country's changed, a lot of those Democrats that voted for Kennedy are yeah. now Republicans, or their children are. You don't have to tell me. They, they should be on. So uh, Lyndon Johnson's prophecy even about the future, even in Massachusetts, <laughs> about the future trajectory of the South uh, has turned out to be true, but is it, is it permanently true? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. My, my impression is that the Republicans are overstepping themselves. There's a radicalism about the Republican Party now that I don't think it's, being, it's going to be permanently endearing to the American people. I think there's going to be a reversion of what happened two years ago. And I think that reversion will start uh, in 2012. That soon? I think so. I feel, very, I feel very confident now that we'll have a Democrat reelected in 2012.
but the, in the midterms, the House and Senate swung uh, I know. hard in the other direction. I know. I saw that. And, and <laughs> I, my, my grandson was elected, by the way. He's a Democrat, and he's, uh, he's in the state Senate now. So maybe he's kind of an omen of the future. He's very young, but, but he won overwhelmingly. And uh, so I don't think the tide has changed permanently. It never has in the past. That's one thing you can depend on in America is the tide is going to change. The book is White House Diary. The author is Jimmy Carter. Please thank him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good question. Thank you again. Don't forget the book. Thank you all very much.